Hello and welcome to another World War II podcast. I'm Angus Wallace. In this episode, we'll be looking at a Luftwaffe long-range patrol group flying for up to 18 towers... 18 hours at a time looking for Allied shipping. Once spotted, they would relay the position to the U-boat packs. But before we get started, I was looking at iTunes recently and discovered a raft of favourable five-star reviews. To those people who've left a review, I thank you. I was rather touched. It's always nice to get feedback and hear someone is actually enjoying the podcast. Indeed, things seem to be going rather well in the podcast bunker. Um, The only thing I need more of is time. And I now have such a backlog of topics. I was wondering about uh, perhaps slipping in an extra episode, looking at the Batan, 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 Death March. Don't forget, if you want more World War II chat, why not become a patron of the show? You'll get access to extras. These so far have ranged from five minute snippets to 30 minutes off mic chat with a guest. There's not always an extra chat to release, but I do try to find something to say a big thank you to those people who support the show with a dollar or so each month. So to become a patron of the show, go to patreon.com slash ww2podcast or click on Donate on the website, www2podcast. So let's get cracking. I'm joined by Robert Forsyth. His latest book is Shadow Over the Atlantic, The Luftwaffe and the U-Boats, 1943-45. So, Robert, can I check with you <laughs> as a sort of starting point? How do we pronounce it? Is it the... If I give it a bash first, you can laugh at me. Fernauf... Klarung's group of Fumf Atlantique. How's that? Perfect. Depending where they come, where you come from in Germany, it will be Fernauf Klarung's group of Fumf Atlantique. Yeah, Fernauf Klarung's group Or it, the, you know, when Luftwaffe Bod talks to Luftwaffe Bod, it just becomes Fag Five. Fantastic. That does make it easier because I, I did sort of break it down. To think I, I must check that before I. Well, it actually means okay. Okay, right. So here we go. So Fernauf Klarungsgruppe, Fern is German for long, long distance, long range. Auf Klarungs means reconnaissance. And Gruppe obviously is group in the sense of um, basically the Luftwaffe structure was that the main tactical unit was the Geschwada. And that was effectively a wing of aircraft, anywhere between 30, 40, up to 70 aircraft, depending on the type of mission, depending on the type of aircraft, depending on its on its tactical briefing, etc. And a Geschwader was then broken down usually into three or four Gruppen. The Gruppen was a smaller tactical unit, very, uh, in some respects, semi-autonomous, usually 20 to 30 aircraft. And then that grouper was then broken down into what were Staffeln, which were squadrons, the nearest translation is squadrons. And they could be, you know, about 12, 12 aircraft. So a Staffel was the smallest sort of organized tactical unit. So this unit, uh, Fenafklarung's Gruppe 5, was uh, intended to be of three. And in fact, there was a fourth Staffel, a Staffel. And it was a tactical grouping. And I don't think there was any ever, there was ever certainly any any indication that it was going to go much above that because the Luftwaffe tended to look at it as being a specialist thing. It was doing a specialist task. Uh, and therefore, the, the grouper was the, the prime tactical element for that. If we go just before you know, the, the start, before its formation, um, you know, Germany had always it struck me as Germany had always planned for a U-boat war in the interwar, yeah, U-boat war in the interwar years. Um, and the battle at the Atlantic starts in sort of 1940, reaches its peak in 43, yet, um, the unit sort of comes into existence in late 43. Was there anything predating it or even envisaged in those interwar years to take the role of sort of long range reconnaissance working with the uh, U-boats? Well, there, there was. The, the, the thing with the Luftwaffe's maritime capability and, and indeed its ambitions is it's a story of paradox. There was a lot of infighting in the early part of the war um, between the Navy 
and the Luftwaffe and Göring being the character he was wanted to assume, you know, you know, control of maritime air assets, but they never really invested a lot of serious time, energy, money, cost, ambition, design into a maritime air force. Now, that's not to say the Luftwaffe didn't have maritime squadrons. It did. It's not to say it didn't have good aircraft. Uh, aircraft. It did. It had very good aircraft, uh, float planes, flying boats. It was very much a coastal aircraft, a uh, coastal uh, a force. It was... Um, mainly there for patrol work, um, loosely for defence. There was no real spirit of offensive nature, I don't think, on the part of the Luftwaffe. They didn't. They were really there, I think, because they, they foresaw the main objective of the Luftwaffe being conquest over land and land warfare. Bring into that personality struggles, personality conflicts between Dönitz and, 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 as I say, Göring and other, other indivi- high, high, high placed individuals in the Luftwaffe. There was a lot of it inter service rivalry. It did, it just got off to a bit of a bad start. Certainly, as you say, until 1943, it was very fractured and very splintered. And really, the Luftwaffe kind of thought, well, our object is to bomb and to gain air superiority. So what we'll do is we'll, send aircraft out over the over the Atlantic and will bomb ships. And that's what they did. And they had an aircraft called the Fokker Wolf Condor, which which was a, a converted airliner, four engine converted airliner. You know, that did a reasonable job. But as the scale of the Atlantic war grew, actually, the Luftwaffe was caught slightly unprepared and there weren't enough Condors anyway. And and certainly in terms of other aircraft, there was an aircraft, Blonham Voss, uh, designed and, and built an enormous flying boat. I think it was the largest flying boat of its kind, actually, called the BV-222. Again, had the range, but they just had such tiny numbers. So the Luftwaffe, I think, was, shall we say, ill-prepared at that juncture, really. Uh, and the origins of that ill-preparedness are... You know, we know better and, 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 uh, we're going to fight a land war and, and, and conflicts of personality. Yeah, it, it, that's very much struck me as, as it was, um, yeah, as you said, that they were sort of, sort of so busy squabbling amongst themselves over the politics of the unit that actually there were, it's not a denial that you, the unit needed to, to exist. It, it was more of a, you know, a politics of who was, if you're going to have it, we want it and not you kind of thing. And there was also the dynamics of the fact that, meanwhile, away in Germany at a place called Dessau, the aircraft firm Junkers had developed this astonishing aeroplane, the Junkers Ju-290. Now, the the, the origins of the Ju-290 lie, as with the Fokker Wolf 200 Condor, in a a, a civil airline, a civil transport aircraft. Uh, There was an aircraft called the Junkers 90, which was used by uh, Lufthansa, lovely big four engine aircraft which was designed as a you know because much like britain germany had international long-range international aspirations its airline lufthansa was streets ahead in many respects of of other world airlines i mean if you look at um uh, places like the Berlin Tempelhof airport hubs and uh, and Frankfurt, uh, uh, you know, Lufthansa was a really go ahead state of the art airline. And, and that was reflected in their airplanes as well. So Junkers had basically gone into large four engine, long range commercial civilian commercial aircraft. And um, the Ju-290 grew out of that, grew out of the design. And it was built and designed at Dessau specifically as a military transport. And it was a big aircraft range of up to um, 6,000 kilometers. And it, initially it was designed to ferry men and vehicles. And it was built with a very uh, advanced and unique. One of its features was a very advanced thing called the Trapo Clapper, which was a uh, built into the rear part of the fuselage was a, a door that dropped down to the ground slowly. It had treaded edges so that vehicles could, it was like a ramp, a big ramp, uh, so that vehicles the size of an Opel Blitz, uh, a small armored car, what have you, could drive straight up into the aircraft fuselage, much like we see on, you know, modern trans, post-war transport aircraft. But it also had in the middle of between the two ramps, a moving escalator step so people could walk up into the into the fuselage it it was very technologically advanced and very big so they built this thing 
And then they realized simultaneously that the, the war over the Atlantic was progressing and they didn't have an aircraft suited to get further out into the West Atlantic, beyond Ireland and down yeah. to Spain and to the Straits of Gibraltar. It's a hell of a distance, isn't it? Yeah. So, aha, those good gentlemen at Dessau, they've developed the Ju-290. Let's look at it. And that's really slowly how this aircraft began to filter its way into the Luftwaffe's consciousness. And um, and also because Dernitz was continually banging the table to say, I need eyes. I've got to have eyes over the Atlantic. He was developing the pack philosophy. He needed to get to a convoy quickly. He needed to know, he needed to know where those convoys were. And so he needed an aircraft that could get out there quickly and most importantly, have the range. And he fought a battle continually to, to, to convince the Luftwaffe that he needed it and to get a sufficient quantity of aircraft in place. And, and that was his, his great struggle. To, to, to give it some perspective, how did it compare to, say, the British Sunderland or the uh, Catalina? Do you know? Well, actually, funnily enough, the two aircraft did meet, or at least a Sunderland and a, and a, and a, and a, a Ju-290 did meet on a couple of occasions and they didn't actually fight each other. They, they, they would look at each other and then fly away. <laughs> So I think they were wary of each other. I think the Sun, if I'm correct, I think the Sunderland had the had the edge in terms of in terms of range. What I can tell you is that the the, the, the Ju-290 displayed remarkable for a, for an aircraft of its size maneuverability, and I, and I think um, that's possibly a credit to both the aircraft design and and, and the the flying skills of the of, of the of the pilots. Uh, I think possibly the Ju-290 may have had the edge in terms of maneuverability. I think the, the the Sunderland probably had the edge in terms of ordnance carrying capability and range. I mean, and, and you say maneuverability. I couldn't believe it when I. It's forty one to forty five tons. Yeah. When you say it's big, that that's big. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a big old thing, and it had you know it had the range to get out way to the west of Ireland. It could have gone way to the north west of Scotland from its base in in western France. Right up, it could have ranged right up to you know almost Iceland, and and then right down to uh, to Gibraltar, uh, which it which it did frequently. And as a crew of eleven, what are they all doing? These guys were out there at fifteen to eighteen hours at a stretch, so you needed two pilots, uh, you needed two flight engineers, uh, you needed a radio operator. The crew sometimes got away with one radio operator. Uh, you often needed, you know, two navigators, and there was obviously defensive armament. There was a rear gunner, and there were other gunners. And the flight engineers sometimes did double as air gunners as well. And there was a lot of kit to be operated. I mean, the the, the aircraft came with ship search radar, and and you know there was a lot of skill in uh, in, in crewing it and, and and operating it. So. Yeah, they were all fully occupied, but they also had to sleep as well. So there was a change of crew because of the duration of their missions. Did it have, um, I want to say, crew quarters? I'm not sure if you talk about crew quarters on, on an aeroplane because you know these you're on an 18 you know hour mission. Do they just have their sandwiches in a thermos and uh, hunker down where they can to when they have time off? <laughs> the later models certainly did have very crude bunks fitted. They also had um, a crude toilet fitted. And there was a, a kitchen area, a galley, and the Germans did have thermos flasks. They had dried food. One member of the crew would cook the food. He would he would be nominated, usually a gunner, would be nominated as the cook, quote, unquote. And in, in fact, there was usually a tradition where mission end, when they came in across the biscuit, the cook would always be called up to get the last drop of coffee out of the thermos flask because as they came across the biscuit, that was often the most dangerous time when they were coming back into their airfield at Mont de Marsan after a long, long flight. By this stage, the Allies had developed, uh, as you meant, not just the Sunderland, as you mentioned, but what the Allies called VLR aircraft, very long range aircraft. The, the Liberator was operating, the Mosquito was operating, escort carriers had sea hurricanes and marklets effectively the, the, the British maritime version of the, of, the, of the Wildcat, it was very, very dangerous. Uh, Luftwaffe fighter cover was, you know, scant at best. So coming back across the Bisky after you've been in the air for 12, 13, 14, 15 hours, your eyes are tired, 
was a very dangerous time. So gunners were often called, you know, get that last bit of black coffee out of the thermos flask and uh, let's keep our eyes peeled and, and awake. Stay alert. Yeah, stay alert. <laughs> Should we look at how they were used? I mean, they're, they're flying out into over vast tracts of, uh, I mean, vast tracts of ocean. Are they just randomly trying to spot shipping? Is that okay? Well, the, the the unit was formed and trained up trained up at a, a base in Germany called Achmer, and then they moved forward November forty three to Mont de Marsan, which is in western France on the Atlantic coast, north of the Pyrenees. They basically would fly a course, usually just straight out over the Biscay to a pre designated point, and then they would start. This was normally sort of west of uh west of northwestern spain the finisterre and they would adopt a pattern called the suchkreiser which was the search search circles basically they would sweep uh, a sea area of about 80 kilometers radius in a circle and they would just keep flying these circles um so that progressively there'd be a if you like a whole square, if that makes sense, of a grid of these circles, which would have been swept by an aircraft. By 1943, it's fair to say somewhere out there, there was a convoy or there was ships. There always were. But it's a vast area. And again, the problem was they didn't have many aircraft. So certainly in the early weeks of Fag Five's formation and and actually through to early 1944, sometimes it was just down to one aircraft. The commander of the unit, uh, a, a, a man called Herman, Major Herman Fisher, devised a tactic. He said, look, you know, we have to give, the, you know, one aircraft isn't enough. A, it can't see enough, and B, it's got to defend itself. So eventually the tactical doctrine or the the tactical doctrine that, that that fisher and his staff aspired to was to send aircraft out in in pairs at least pairs um because they could offer some form of mutual defense so when that happens sometimes one aircraft would be the eyes to the water and one aircraft would be the eyes in in, in the air keeping an eye out for enemy activity and most of the time it's certainly in hours of daylight it was down to good old eyeball and until technology was introduced. So when they spot when they spot a convoy, but I mean, how do they get into? How do they convey, convey that the convoy uh, its location? Yeah. To to the U boat. Okay. Well, th th that was by radio. They would radio back to U boat headquarters in 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 France and Paris, and I think also in northern Germany. It was done purely by radio, and again. There you have one aeroplane or two aeroplanes way out in the Atlantic, often in bad weather, relying on radio. And I've researched using files in the National Archives where Allied interceptors have picked up the radio traffic. It, it, it's it's fairly safe to say that actually the Allies developed the, 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 their ability to intercept and to track and, and to read German radio traffic was was pretty good. And. If you look at the files, the transcripts in the National Archives, you know, radio radio transmissions between a Junkers 290 on a January or February day way out to the west of Ireland was not always 100 percent reliable. And trying to get a signal back to never mind Mont de Marsan, but trying to get, get a signal back to U-boat headquarters inland was not 100 percent reliable. And often you, you, you get situations where U-boat command is trying to make contact with a, with a JU-290 and they're just not getting anything back. And then often what would happen is that, that the crew would land back at mont marsan and they would say, well, we were trying to signal. We were doing it. And clearly the, 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 the radio <laughs> transmission just didn't, just didn't work. Um, but having said that, Fisher did report hundreds of thousands of tons of Allied shipping that was spotted by his aircraft and reported. Whether or not that got back is very questionable. When, when they spot them, do they have to basically stay on point tracking them? Or yeah, they would. They would get as as near to the convoy 
there were dynamics that kicked into place. You know, was there known Allied air activity over the convoy? And invariably, there was. You know, was there an escort carrier close at hand? What was the the, the visibility like? What what time of day was it? Because obviously, the hours of darkness it got it got more increasingly difficult. Y- yeah, I mean, they just got as near as they could to, and the and the more they did it, you know, there were certain crew, not just pilots, but crew gunners they all they all took their fair share uh, that got pretty adept at spotting and recognizing certain types of vessels and and, and they had you know the luftwaffe's <laughs> spotter's guide to allied shipping a, li- a small silhouette flip book yeah absolutely <laughs> and so some of them got pretty pretty some of these guys got pretty adept at it uh and they reported back they were also aided uh, eventually uh they were given something called the funkgerat radio device uh, 200, which was known as the, the Hohentfiel, which was literally deer's, deer's antlers, which were, uh, was a ship, a ship search radar, uh, developed by Telefunken, I think it was, that graced the front of the, um, the Ju 290's, um, uh, nose, the dipole, uh, r- radar antennae. That helped because they were able to detect and pick up electronically and the equipment was quite advanced shipping and 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 convoys but again not all aircraft had it and it was a very embryonic stage of development they never had enough of it that was their problem it was never enough did i read correctly they operated at a height of a thousand meters and when they were shattering it they were flying at 20 to 40 meters all of which seems amazingly low yeah they could get right down above the wave tops and some crews, particularly the, the the more senior officers, I mean, these some of these guys had been Lufthansa pre-war Lufthansa pilots. You know, I once talked to a fellow aviation historian who should remain nameless, who said to me once when I embarked about on, on this this project, "What do you want to write about those guys for? All they did was fly around miles and miles and of be all and do sweet FA sort of thing." And I took issue with that when I read about how they trapped some of these convoys in filthy weather as you said going all you know right down almost to the deck in these big aircraft to mm. make a positive id of, of of allied shipping in the teeth of allied air defense and then to actually be able to evade and defend themselves against allied fighters as well was quite something and also they would go back over neutral over the over spanish territory as well some of these guys, a couple of these guys, unfortunately, did meet meet their end because they they wanted to evade Allied radar detection, so they flew very very close to the ground, and uh, and unfortunately, a couple of them did actually meet unpleasant, you know, literally flying into Spanish hillsides and things. You know, apart from anything else, they had some very skilled pilots, uh, and, and and pilots that were able to keep awake for very very long missions that, that, or if that was is it peritin the yeah, germans peritin. Used? yeah i i didn't find any uh, funny enough that you know the fighter pilots used peritin um the, these guys from what i you know reading reading your report they seem to get by very strong black ersatz coffee <laughs> so yeah yeah <laughs> well it, it's not just the pilots because presumably uh from a navigational point of view it's one thing flying over you know if they're Luftwaffe, they're training to support the army. You're flying over land. You can, uh, if you get lost, you can find landmarks. Flying in endless circles over the sea in a, some sort of grid pattern uh, must be fantastically complicated for the navigators to keep track of quite where they are. Yes, these guys were skilled in in astro navigation. Uh, along the top of the fuselage, there was a clear perspex dome. And inside the fuselage, there was a, a, a circular metal platform and two of the crew members would take readings from the stars and and, and use astro navigation at, at night. And they were very skilled navigators. And it applied to that applied to the whole crew. You know, you obviously had skilled pilots. You had skilled navigators qualified in astro navigation. You had gunners. The gunners went through a very high degree of training for long range gunnery to use MG131 MG uh, MG1 uh, MG151 cannon um because one thing the Luftwaffe did recognize was that you know to defend these things to defend themselves these guys would actually have to engage 
allied aircraft as soon as possible and get you know often at long range and they had the weapons to do it 20 millimeter cannon but they were all very very skilled men there was no fat on board if that if that made sense you know the you know the flight engineers balancing fuel knowing when to take fuel from remain from from reserve wing tank into the main tank at the right time keeping an eye on fuel levels over such a long mission that they were all very you know very very skilled and qualified aviators presumably they were quite you know at such a size they must must be quite susceptible for uh, uh attack by uh allied fighters or or, or or if not fighters you know the the mosquito or you know working in a fighter role yes by uh, late 43 and early 1944 as you say allied aircraft were ranging quite a low a long way south definitely across the bay of biscay from bases in England, able to reach the northern coast of Spain. And there were a, a number of incidences, several incidences where bow fighters and mosquitoes made contact with J, these big JU-290s and there was uh, there were dust-ups. Uh, there was one, one air battle particularly where mosquitoes, bow fighters, Junkers 290s, long-range JU-88 fighters all got involved in an air battle that lasted for some two hours off the north coast of Spain. It broke up into different skirmishes, but I've often thought that must have been a heck of a sight watching these big two or three of these big Ju 290s with Ju 88 escort, which was quite a rare thing anyway. You know, having a having an, a, an air a dogfight with with Davila mosquitoes and Bristol bow fighters over a vast tract of sky. So by late 43, early 44, it's to say that a number of Ju 290s did fall prey to to mosquitoes. And, you know, an aircraft like the Mosquito or bow fighter ultimately flown well is is going to make fairly short. If you were in a Ju 90 and you had a mosquito on your tail, your time was pretty well up. Having said that, uh, the Ju 290s would often seek refuge in cloud. In the book, there is uh, descriptions of frustrated bow fighter pilots losing Ju 290s in cloud. And then the other threat to them was 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 was, was escort carriers. Uh, you know, they were able to launch Sea Hurricanes and Marklets. There were engagements w- with Ju 290s, but you know they were big, but they were very well defended, and I think they were quite tough aircraft to shoot down, actually. Mm. I hadn't realised there was so many escort. I don't know why. It's just my ignorance. I hadn't realised there was so many escort carriers. Well, there was there was there was one particular escort which was converted by the U.S. dockyards on the east the east coast of the states, and there was one called Biter. HMS Biter was a flat top, and it 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 almost fought its own little war against Fag Five. Biter protected a couple of convoys, and it was always there when the Ju 290s seemed to be there as well. And so they kind of had their own private little little war with the Ju 290s. Very, very demanding, very, very difficult flying for both sides. But, but on the flip side, at least when they came back, they were in France. They were based in France, weren't they? Which must have been a relatively comfy posting because prior to that, were they in Russia, a lot of the pilots? They were in Russia, yeah. The, the unit started out, uh, the unit was formed, uh, FAG 5 was formed from two German reconnaissance squadrons, both short-range army Corporation and liaison squadrons, and um, the guys had uh, they'd flown a variety of aircraft from Henschel 126 high wing single engine monoplane spotters in Russia through to Ju 88s, uh, fast fast twin engine reconnaissance aircraft in in Russia. And um, these guys, you know, they they weren't maritime pilots. I mean, they'd been flying overland missions for army observations, army observation. It says something again for the crews that they they were you know rather hurriedly trained at Achma in the autumn of 1943 and found themselves out over the Atlantic pretty quickly. But the pilots had long range experience with there was a cadre of pilots, a backbone, a spine, if you like, that had long range flying experience with Lufthansa pre-war. So, so some of these couple of the pilots had done far east, far eastern flights for uh, for, for for Lufthansa, and there was a spy a cadre of pilots that that I think were veterans and and I think they gave uh, reassurance to some of the less experienced crew and and they gelled together and 
molded together very, very, very well. But yes, they they have been in Russia up until the uh, the autumn of forty three, and then uh, and and yeah, France was a cushy posting, but the airfield uh, Montmartre did get bombed and strafed. They had to put up adequate flak defences at, at Montmartre, and of course at the end that uh, that cushy posting got quite difficult because gradually Montmartre got cut off after Normandy, the Allied invasion of Normandy. In fact, one by one, in June 44, and, and between June and actually August 44, the last aircraft left, I think, they were flown out and they had to load equipment. You know, they even took pigs with them, um, which they which they caught in, in, in France, and bottles of brandy and not to mention all their standard electronic equipment and weaponry. One by one, they had to evacuate Montmartre and fly back to Germany. And some of these aircraft, when they landed back at German fields, they landed on grass fields, which I always thought was a bit of a mistake. And they were so heavily laden that the wheels just ground into the into the mud and they had to be pulled out because they were so heavily laden. But the ground staff, uh, and as I recount in the book, the, the, the ground staff made an epic move across France. It's a wonderful story in itself. It is. I mean, it was almost like a kind of bizarre Pied Piper type thing where a man called Oscar Schmidt, who was the, uh, the in charge of the staff company, literally assembled every vehicle he could get hold of, including wood burning vehicles and as well as petrol vehicles and drove across France. And along the way, they picked up collaborators. They picked up tracked Wehrmacht units. They picked up panicking SS officers and their secretaries with cases of documents and other disbanded Luftwaffe units. They picked up an Indian volunteer unit, an Indian uh, an Indian Wehrmacht unit. And they have Russian, is it, are we Hibis? Russian troops? They had Hibis, yeah, they, they had... They had Russian prisoners. They came from Russia with the original reconnaissance units that formed FAG-5. And then they went with FAG-5 to Montmartre. And then they helped to build the, air, the airfield infrastructure. At the end, when they got back into uh, into Germany, they were very – both the Russians and, and, the, and the Luftwaffe men were – Apparently, very sorry to say goodbye to each other. They became quite quite a cohesive unit, I think. Strangely enough, they had the novel idea of taking some of their twenty millimeter aircraft cannon and actually rigging them up on the top of this rather eclectic group of vehicles and using them as defence. And indeed, this rather bizarre column of vehicles. And I think at one point it got up to a they were a hundred vehicles long. You know, they got they got strafed by mosquitoes, typhoons, but their main enemy was the resistance. And there were, you know, fought running battles fought with cells of French maquisade in various places across France. And there were casualties on both sides. It's a it's a wonderful story of of, of of sort of confusion where they're being asked to be, get involved in counter attacks as they pass through German lines and things. And they said, "No, oh, we we we've got to go back to the rest of our unit." And uh, it, it's a wonderful picture of the confusion in in Europe of, in that sort of forty four forty five sort of period. Yes, and 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 and, uh, and, 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 and at least on at least one occasion, Schmidt, who was a relatively you know junior officer actually had the wherewithal to say, uh, no, I'm not hanging around, mate, because 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 basically a German garrison in a in a in a cut off ta- a cut off town or an increasingly cut- isolated town said, oh, you know, he saw these aircraft cannon. Oh, oh, can you stay here and help defend? And he said, no, I'm, I'm I want to preserve it. I want to get back to my unit. I want to preserve what we've got. And and he did. And he and he made it back into Germany. And, and then having got back into Germany, the unit became very fragmented. It was. Um, one part of it got involved in the development of something called the Messerschmitt ME-264, known as the America Bomber, uh, which was going to be an ultra long range aircraft intended to uh, conduct shipping strikes as far as the, the U.S. eastern seaboard. And some of the officers from FAG-5 obviously were uh, ordered by the German Air Ministry to get involved in the development of that aircraft, working with uh, experts from uh, from Messerschmitt. Other elements of the unit got involved with a 
because they had long range aircraft and they were now back in Germany, got involved with a, a, a covert, the Luftwaffe's covert operations unit called Kampfgeschwader 200, KG 200. And they were used to drop uh, small cells of nationalist Arabs in North Africa and in I- Iraq to sow dissent and to damage oil pipelines and behind it, basically nuisance attacks in the yeah. underbelly of, of a- allied power. I don't really know how much good it did at that point of the war, but these aircraft, these Junkers 290s, which had not long previously had been flying these long range missions over the Atlantic, were suddenly doing these covert operations to North Africa and over the Balkans, dropping spies and nationalist groups. And then ultimately, the unit also got involved with one of the most technologically advanced aircraft the Luftwaffe flew, which was the Arado 234 jet. And a couple of pilots, well, not a few pilots were trained up to fly, to fly the Arado from airfields in Denmark and, uh, and Norway, again, intended to develop the whole concept of FAG-5 to a, a new level of sophistication with what were hoped would be a new generation of U-boats. Yeah, it's funny. It's, I think we probably said it right, right to where at the start how uh, they're still desperately clinging to these super weapons even at the at the very end when they're not going to be really very practical when they're you know, so close to what was obviously the end to most people. Yeah, well, there were these uh, Type 21 U-boats with going to be with snorkel devices and all, all, all sorts of things. And, and the plan was that... Um, these Arados would get very, very quickly to places such as Kappa Flow and be able to re- get to areas where they were needed very, very quickly, use very high definition, very advanced camera te- camera equipment and get and get reports back very, very quickly, which, of course, Junkers 290 didn't ca- didn't 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 have that speed and, and all the cameras. So, um I have a note to myself, I can't quite remember the story, that it says, unlike the army who marched into captivity, they drove. (laughs) They did. They went up into Denmark. They did manage to purloin some some vehicles for at least part of the way. And in fact, some some of the aircraft actually were being used right up until the last dying days, hours of the war. There was one aircraft that was used to take a locked filing cabinet down from northern Germany to Munich Ream. And there's this wonderful story about how they landed at the airfield and just dumped this filing cabinet in the middle of the airfield and took off again as quickly as they could. The filing cabinet was the was it was was, was the uh, the property of some rather dubious SS officer. But uh, otherwise, yeah, most of, most of the unit ended up driving uh, and marching across the border in in into Denmark. And from dead, sorry, then from Denmark back into Ger- into Germany, where they were captured, I think, to they surrendered to to some relief to, to British forces, although they held their heads high and much the, to the irritation of at least one British officer. They they stopped. They refused to stop singing German songs. As they marched into into uh, into captivity. Officers were allowed to keep their firearms, remarkably enough, until a certain point when eventually they had to hand them over. It was a sort of strange period. It seemed to be almost um, what was deemed by the British to be sporting, you know. <laughs> and uh, one by one, these guys eventually somehow they just they all wound their way wound their ways home. Was the unit ultimately was it too little, too late? I mean, did, it struck me they never seemed to have enough aircraft. Crews were probably a problem. Just due to the caliber that they needed yeah when they lost one aircraft they lost anywhere between 10 and 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 12 men and depending on serviceability and availability of crews i mean missions were flown missing the old gunner but you know you know men were ill you know sometimes men just were ill but nevertheless when the, when they lost an aircraft it was a lot of men and when a ju290 went down you know they had to replace as we said, a lot of skilled men. And also by the spring of 1944, there was another front, very much so. And that was the front over Germany. You know, by this time, Germany was fighting a three front, uh, uh, well, a four front war. I mean, it was fighting in the east, it was fighting in the south, and it was fighting in the west. And it was also fighting over its roof uh, as the Luftwaffe was 
called it, you know, they had to put up a steel umbrella. By then, the emphasis and the, the urgency was to build fighters. Uh, what we needed were 109s, Focke 190s, and Messerschmitt 109s to combat the United States Strategic Air Force and, R- and RAF Bomber Command. To come along and say we want to build a big four-engined aircraft, it takes an awful lot of raw, raw material and resources. It takes a long time to build, and it's expensive. It lost priority. And so although the, the, the battle at the Atlantic was still being fought, no, they never had enough aircraft. And when a JU-290 was shot down by the spring of 1944, wasn't going to be replaced in a hurry. And likewise with the crews, the, 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 the pressure was on fighter pilots, fighter pilots, fighter pilots. And that's what the schools were doing. That's where the, the emphasis was. So Dernitz really, Dernitz and the U-boat arm from that perspective, I think were really on a hiding to nothing. It, 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 it was just, I think Dernitz must have known that he was he was fighting a losing battle it, if he was trying to going to try and get the Luftwaffe to provide. He never got the eyes that he really wanted. But but Fag Five did uh, did fight a valiant war, and they did did report back um, a consider they you know they reported back a considerable amount of tonnage, uh, and they and and they dropped um, uh, the other thing that Fag Five did was drop things called Schwann, German for swan boys. So they would drop boys into the Atlantic, which set out radio beacons, signals to U-boat crews. So they would find a convoy, drop a boy, that would send out beacon signals, and U-boats would home in on the beacons. But again, they never had enough. It was always too little too late. That's often the case with the with with, with the set world with the Germans. So, what, what are you working on next? Uh, right now, I'm working on a, a sort of related book uh, on the the Heinkel 177, <laughs> which which was an interesting aircraft, the Greif, the Griffin, which was the four engine strategic bomber that that, that never was really a uh, fascinating aeroplane. Uh, also, played its role over the Atlantic albeit in, in, in limited numbers, uh, but with some extraordinary advanced guided air weapons. After that, I'm working on a, uh, another book connected with the Messerschmitt 210, 410 twin-engined heavy fighters um, and, and their role in the story of the, uh, the air battles over Germany. So uh, I keep keeping busy. Yeah, yeah. You get your map, life mapped out. <laughs> How hard is it to difficult? How difficult is to re- is it to research uh, like yeah, you know, such as Fag Five? Is there a lot of um, papers available? Well, I, well, I, well, well, the impetus for for Fag Five really came from the fact that uh, I, I was very fortunate. Uh, it found me. I didn't find it. Uh, I was able to get through uh, a, a, a friend in America a, a privately produced history of the unit, which was absolutely astonishing, written by this gentleman called Oscar Schmidt, uh, together with some of his comrades. And they almost put together a, a sort of unofficial um, day-to-day story of the unit, based mainly on recollection, but also a, a few combat reports, which are incredibly uh, – operational reports, which are incredibly rare. And so that gave me the bedrock, the platform, if you like, on on how to go forward. And I was very fortunate – at the same time, the UK National Archives uh, released the Allied uh, intercepted radio signals. So I would have on one side uh, the story of a crew saying, well, we went up in such and such an aircraft and this is what we did. And then on the other side, I'd have very accurate Allied radio traffic. So I was able to start to put the story together from both sides. And also I was fortunate enough to get a few allied in- encounter reports. And so I tried to, as I say, tell the story as much as I c- could could from both sides. And it, it came together over a, over a period of about eight years. And on and off, you know, chipping away at it here and there and here and there. And, and eventually, you know, I, I realized I, I had a couple of lever arch file loads on this stuff. And I thought, well, I'll, there is a story here. And I was very, I was very fortunate in that, um, uh, you know, the publisher that I used, Osprey Publishing, did did show interest in the project, and and that's how um, Shadow of the Atlantic came to be. It's about time I'm going to pull all this th- these eight lever arch files together. <laughs> yeah, yeah, quite absolutely. Yeah, Robert, thanks for that. <laughs>
I'll put a link to the book on the website, Shadow of the Atlantic, the Luftwaffe and the U-Boats, 1943-45. And patrons, don't forget to look out for that little bit extra. Those who aren't patrons and might have a dollar to spare, you can support the show by going to patreon.com slash ww2podcast. Thanks, that's it for this time out. I'm Angus Wallace and thanks for listening.